Welcome everyone. I'm Joe Constan, the College of Science and Engineering's Associate Dean for Research, and I'm your MC for this event. I am delighted that so many of you are here. We've had registrations from nearly 200 alumni and friends from across the country and around the world, and more people who I know will be watching this uh, after we're done recording it and, and posting it. Tonight, you will hear from Dean Moss Cave and from three of the college's distinguished faculty members. But before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. If you prefer to listen to today's webinar by phone rather than through your computer audio, you can call in using the instructions on the screen. We also welcome you to submit your questions for our three keynote presenters at any time during the webinar. There's a Q&A button near the bottom, which will pop up a window where you can type in questions and we'll be reviewing the questions as they come in and, and collecting and clustering them to ask to our speakers at the end of the event. If you're having any technical issues, please type them in the chat window and one of our staff will assist you. You can just send them to panelists and we'll be happy to help you. If you wanna chat with your fellow alumni, friends and students, make sure that you send your message to all panelists and attendees so that they know you're here and have a chance to, to say hello back. Finally, as I mentioned, we're recording today's webinar and I'll share the link to the video uh, with all uh, registrants when the event is over. We'll get that out to you by, by email. So now I'm very pleased to introduce Dean Moss Cave. Dean Cave has served as Dean of the University of Minnesota's College of Science and Engineering since 2018, but has held many roles in the college for more than 40 years. Before serving as Dean, he was Associate Dean for Research and Planning, Prior to that, he was head of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering from 1990 to 2005. He joined the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering as a faculty member in 1975 and has been here contributing to the college's mission ever since. Dean Cave, unmute yourself and take it away. If you could unmute yourself, we'll be ready. I did, for some reason it switched. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, and uh, good, good evening, everybody. As uh, in constant mentioned, I'm Moss Kaba, the Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. And it is really my honor to welcome you to this evening's installment of our Curiosity Drives Progress Lecture Series. Although this is our first all virtual lecture, we introduced this series in 2018 to showcase the breadth of incredible research being done across the college by emerging new talents, as well as seasoned experts in their fields alike. Since its inception, I've been particularly excited about this series. As uh, Joe mentioned, I've been in the college as associate dean for research and planning, and of course as dean, and during this uh, long period, I've seen firsthand the groundbreaking research, usually in collaboration with students and staff, taking place across all of our 12 departments, our program in history of science, technology, and medicine, and our many research centers. Today's diverse science and engineering challenges demand creative and educated minds. Innovators who ask the critical questions and work tirelessly to discover the answers. CSC's faculty and students are pushing forward the frontiers of discovery and redefining what's possible every day. Each of these lectures, <clears throat> lectures features three faculty members presenting brief overviews of their research related to a larger theme. 
So far, we've featured topics ranging from advancing human health to safety and security. And recordings of these uh, past lectures are available on the CSE website if you've missed them. I'm pleased to share that we learned earlier this week that in fact, one of our past featured speakers, alumnus and professor of chemical engineering and material science, Professor Paul Downhauer was selected as a fellow, as a MacArthur Fellow for 2020, which is known as a Genius Awardee, or is a recipient of a Genius Grant from the MacArthur Foundation. So that tells you the, um, the quality of work that, that you hear in these lectures. Those, this, this evening's lecture was originally scheduled to take place in April. Today's theme, impacting communities, feels more timely than ever. While these are uncertain times for all of us, and there are indeed challenges ahead, I assure you that our college's research activities haven't stopped. In fact, faculty are tackling some of the most important issues facing us right now while rising to the challenge of delivering a world-class education to our students in new and innovative ways. CSE's faculty and alumni, as many of you know, invented the retractable seat belt, the black box recorder, the implantable pacemaker, and the transistor, just to name a few. Today's outstanding faculty continue to make transformational impacts on the lives and well-being of Minnesotans and people throughout our country and the world. To tell you more about our college's current research activities, including adjustments made due to COVID-19, I'd like to turn things back to Associate Dean Constant. Joe. Thank you, Moss. Uh, indeed, one of the great pleasures of being Associate Dean for Research in this college is the opportunity to see the breadth of amazing scholarship uh, that goes on with our faculty, but our faculty working side by side with our students. And whether we're talking about you know, new forms of energy that, that hope to liberate us from as much dependence on fossil fuels, or we're talking about putting new telescopes at the South Pole to better understand what's going on in space, or the physicists and chemists making amazing advances uh, to harness quantum mechanics into techniques and, and materials that we can use for information systems. Uh, it's just almost mind blowing to see the amount of talent and energy and frankly curiosity that is driving them towards this progress. Uh, we hit a momentary bump in the road in, in March when, uh, as, as I think you all know through, through the publicity, we had to rapidly tell people, stay home, stay safe. But even as that was going on, our faculty and their labs and their staff and students were quickly pivoting to keep certain critical operations going, and at the same time, uh, to take on new challenges related to COVID. And so from March forward, we worked with them on safe plans for keeping labs open so they could work on protective enclosures for medical personnel, work on the testing and design of new personal protective equipment, work on the uh, COVID virus itself and its chemical structure to look at what possible uh, constructs chemically might be effective at breaking it down, and dozens of other things from the transportation that was going on around COVID to potential treatments and low-cost ventilators uh, that allowed us to participate in not only uh, fighting but in, in saving numerous lives through the innovation of our faculty, staff, and students. Our sunrise plan, as we call it, has moved forward into additional steps where we now have uh, more than a thousand, actually 
about 1,500 faculty, staff, and students who are back in the labs on campus, limited hours, uh, keeping social distance, wearing masks, taking extra precautions so that we can bring the research that needs our incredible facilities back to life. And then many more who never stopped working but are able to do it from home, doing their simulations, computational models, and all sorts of other research from a distance. So the college is strong, the university is strong, but mostly it's inspiring the types of work that people can take as we go forward. And with that as introduction, I wanna move directly on to introducing our first presenter, the inspiring Professor Saif Benjafar. Professor Benjafar is distinguished McKnight University professor at the University of Minnesota, where he's also head of the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. And he directs the initiative on the sharing economy. He's a founding member of the Singapore University of Technology and Design, where he served as the head of engineering systems and design. He's also the editor in chief of the Informs Journal Science, Service Science. And he serves on the board of directors of Our Car, a social car sharing organization. His research is in the area of operations management, broadly defined with a focus on sustainable operations, innovation in business models, including the sharing economy, on-demand services, and digital marketplaces. The work described in this talk has been funded by grants from the U.S. National Science Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Singapore Ministry of Education. Please join me in welcoming Professor Saif Benjafar. Take it away. Great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Again. Okay, great. Uh, great. Thank you, Joe, again, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, glad to see such a great turnout. Um, it is perhaps fitting that I speak to you not in person, but online, since my talk is about uh, this new economy that is on demand and online. Um, so as um, let's see, so I have spent the last eight years working with many faculty colleagues and students here in CSC uh, and around the world uh, on technology to enable many of the features of the on-demand access to products and services. Uh, three of these eight years, I was based in Singapore, as uh, Joe mentioned, where I caught my first glimpse of the on-demand economy and where I took my first Uber ride in 2012. A big aha moment for me that kind of triggered my interest in this general area. And uh, I was fortunate enough when I was in Singapore to work with several startups. Uh, many of these became important players in Southeast Asia in all things on demand, including ride sharing, online shopping, food delivery. Uh, and where we, with colleagues, we established a research initiative around what we called at the time the sharing economy. Um, this effort continued, accelerated where I came back to Minnesota. Uh, what is interesting about that experience is how many of the people we talked to at the time, uh, particularly funding agencies, but also VCs, um, um, I mean, how many uh, felt about the ideas we were proposing? Uh, many felt that they were too far-fetched. Uh, for example, many felt the notion of riding with strangers in a stranger's car was preposterous and not particularly scalable. Uh, many felt it would be difficult to build profitable businesses around food delivery, the running of errands, or the sharing of private homes. Um, uh, as we all know, this has turned out to be one of the most exciting developments in the last 10 years uh, with some of the fastest growing uh, and largest um, companies in the world, uh, from Amazon, uh, online shopping, to Uber, on-demand on mobility, uh, DoorDash, and Grubhub food delivery, Spotify, Netflix, and on-demand music and video, 
and numerous other uh, companies and businesses um, in, engaged in the, in the delivering of on-demand access to health services, education, fitness, and many more. Uh, so let's see. So what does it, so the on-demand economy features um, in the title of the talk. So what does on-demand exactly mean? Uh, we use the term uh, to refer to um, uh, access to products and services as needed. So when, where needed, and in the amount needed as opposed to access that has to be scheduled or access that has to come with the purchase of a quantity that's in excess of what I need here and now. So uh, let me illustrate with two examples from everyday life, buying a car and buying groceries. Uh, so when you buy a car, you buy car usage for the next several years. Uh, you also buy more than what you need, which is typically a few hours per day. This is because until recently, it was difficult for a car company to sell you just a few hours of usage per day. Uh, so similarly with groceries, one would typically buy groceries for the week because the cost of going to the grocery store every day is just too, um, is too much. Uh, as a result, you buy more than what you need today based on estimates often not particularly accurate for what you would consume over the course of the week. This comes with inefficiencies. The stuff you buy requires storage. It can go bad if it's fresh produced, requires refrigeration, consumes electricity, costs money, occupies space. In fact, you could think of the refrigerator as really a solution to the inefficiency of how we consume food. Uh, so what is enabling the on-demand economy and why has it become possible now to summon a car when, when and where you need it? Um, it's the confluence of several technologies, uh, highlighting few here. Uh, so uh, um, pervasive internet, uh, mobile computing, global navigation, satellite system, GPS system, sensing and data at very large scale, and perhaps most importantly, digital banking. So all of these have driven, have resulted in two things. One is the digitization of the physical world. A world. Uh, so turning the physical into digital. So if you think about music and how we consume music, it used to be by physical CD, now you stream online. Uh, and then the cyber control of, uh, of the physical, automation. So this has ultimately, ultimately le leading us to a world where we don't need to own things and we can access them on demand instead. Um, um, uh, now for those who of you who know me, I'm first and foremost an engineer, although I do venture outside and often work with colleagues from the social sciences and other fields. Uh, but my research has been primarily focused on developing analytics to enable on-demand features. For example, developing models and algorithms to optimize last mile delivery. So how to efficiently route vehicles, taking into account real-time information about congestion how to manage the crowdsourcing of these deliveries, models and algorithm for matching riders with drivers in the context of ride sharing, for example, uh, to make decision about prices to charge customers and wages to pay drivers, taking into account fluctuation in supply of drivers and the demand from customers, and models and algorithm for managing shared vehicle networks, um, including when these vehicles are fully or partially automated as part of a big project currently underway, in fact. Um, I've also collaborated with colleagues from business and uh, public policy, economics, uh, trying to understand the impact of this technology as well as of these business models on social welfare, if you may, on the environment, consumer welfare, labor welfare. However, today's talk is not about uh, the technology that powers the on-demand economy, including our work in this area. 
although I'd be happy to answer questions and follow up with you on that. Uh, instead, I would like to reflect with you on what's really driving the on-demand economy and what does it mean for the future. So specifically, I would like to uh, I would like us to think about what these various technological development are fundamentally enabling. Um, so first I would like to argue that much of what has transpired in the 19th and 20th century was about harnessing scale. So scale is significant economies can be achieved um, by uh, supplying products and services in large volumes, okay? Typically high fixed costs that can only be justified when quantities, uh, quantities supplied are large. Uh, so examples of this are many. So factories typically involved in mass production are about scale. Uh, cities are about scale, the efficient provisioning of services needed when the density uh, um, the efficient provisioning of services needed the density of large cities, but also the density of large cities translated in an abundant workforce that in turn enabled economies of scale. The global supply chain is about scale, sourcing the most from the cheapest location and shipping it all in bulk. Um, infrastructure, uh, the interstate highway system, the electricity grid, ports, airports are all about scale. Uh, modern retail, the mega mall, the superstore, the mega dealership are about scale. The modern office with hundreds, in some cases, thousands of workers in a single location. Uh, we all uh, heard today about uh, target uh, and the numbers that caught my attention was that 8,500 people actually work in downtown for target, right? Um, the modern hospital and, and many more. So in all of these cases, and until recently, scale was necessary for efficiency. Um, however, we're entering now an era where that is no longer the case. Uh, an era of what I call scale-free economy. Um, so this freedom uh, from scale is not only enabling the on-demand access to products, uh, but also changing the very nature of the products uh, by unbundling the services embedded in products. So physically, uh, uh, physical products are really a, a, a about the services that they, they contain. Uh, so I don't need the 24 hours of mobility embedded in a car, perhaps two or three hours per day is sufficient. I don't need a hard drive uh, as long as I can access storage when I need it. I don't need to own a music album as long as I can listen to it when I'm in the mood. So the fact that the fact that scale uh, no longer matters or matters less, uh, I believe has important consequences. So I'm gonna highlight a few of these. Um, uh, what I'm gonna call here casualties of the on-demand economy. So these are aspects of the economy and society uh, that are potentially going to be disrupted by the advent of the on-demand economy. So first one is inventory. So if you think about it, much of the built environment is really dedicated to the storage of stuff. Uh, if you look around, uh, the, phys the built environment is, uh, is what? Uh, parking garages, grocery stores, malls, offices, homes. Inside the home, uh, the home is all about uh, storage, refrigerators, closets, garages. Um, so uh, the storage of stuff in anticipation of future consumption made sense when there were economies of scale. What happens to this built environment when that is no longer the case? Um, another ca potential casualty is transportation. Much of transportation uh, 
think about it is really a form of inefficiency driven by the spatial mismatch between where people are and where the products and services they seek are, right? So what happens to transportation when products and services come to people rather than the other way around? Does it make sense to continue to devote significant public resources, for example, to building of roads, highways, parking garages? Um, um, it surprise reading today an article about MSP about to complete a new 5,000 stall parking complex. Would this really make uh, much sense five, 10 years from now? Another potential casualty of the on-demand economy is the global supply chain. So scale-free production, digitized, automated, including 3D printing, can be distributed, small-scale, and localized. Does it make sense to continue to source from faraway places? If not, what happens to these vast supply networks we built uh, along with the supporting infrastructure? Another potential casualty is the firm. For, so for much of the 19th and 20th century, the economy has been dominated by firms, large organizations who came into existence because of their abilities to bring scale to bear and reduce transaction costs. So if scale is no longer a barrier, uh, would we see an economy instead dominated by many small suppliers, many small buyers, involved in many small transactions um, mediated by platforms that match these suppliers and buyers. We sort of see aspects of this in, the, um, in, 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 for example, the app development world, um, in content generation on YouTube and elsewhere. Um, uh, Etsy is an example, right, of, uh, of a platform that mediates supply and demand between many small sellers and buyers. Amazon itself is, is, is a version of that with millions of suppliers selling through uh, uh, the Amazon platform. Another, an, another potential casualty is full-time employment and within the office. So full-time employment, if you think about it, is also driven by economies of scale. It was difficult to ensure the availability of labor for, so for, for, for a company, for a firm, at the, when it was needed uh, because of the, it was costly to hire and fire, right, uh, and to train. Uh, so employers were forced to buy a fixed number of hours and fixed number of workers, right? Uh, but Uber and other on-demand e economy businesses have demonstrated that a different model, more flexible, certainly not without flaws, is possible. And then cities, um, um, Cities are built around proximity to work, schools, hospitals, retail, entertainment. So if geographic proximity is no longer a barrier, what is the value that cities really bring? Uh, what new patterns of land use might we see arise to replace the city or reinvent it? Uh, and then closer to home, uh, what future does the university as we know it have? So universities are built around the delivery of comprehensive offerings to a large cohort of students at a specific location over a specific length of time. Would this continue to make sense? Uh, five, 10, 15 years down the road. Uh, and one could ask similar questions regarding many other aspects of our economy, uh, the way we live, work, play, and how this may be disrupted by skill-free economics. So I invite you to sort of hopefully it triggered some, 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 some thoughts here, and I invite you to sort of consider other aspects of, um, of our economy, of our society, and how, the, how this, this technology might transform them. Uh, let me conclude uh, by noting that while the on-demand economy may bring increased convenience, efficiency, and sustainability, it also poses risks. Uh, an on-demand economy would be largely mediated by platforms, which unless regulated or made into public utilities could become powerful monopolies. 
uh, this is already part of the political um, conversation uh, recently. Uh, income inequality and income uncertainty could become exaggerated in an economy where everyone is a freelancer. Uh, um, in an economy where everything is digitized, privacy could come under threat um, unless countermeasures, including regulation, are put in place. And in a world where social interaction are mediated by technology, the sense of isolation and disconnect from the community around us right, could intensify. And this has implication to how society organizes itself and maintains cohesion. And we've, we've all experienced aspects of this. Um, Therefore, it's imperative, this is my last slide, therefore, it's imperative that we not only focus on developing technology that's going to accelerate the transition to an on-demand economy, but also on technology that leads us to an economy that's just equitable and protective of rights and freedoms. That Thank you, Professor Ben Jafar. That was so, frankly, educational a little scary, but I think it gives us a lot to think about. And uh, I think we all appreciate that you're thinking about it uh, before uh, some of these things lapse into being dystopian because nobody was paying attention. And so we, we really appreciate a, a glimpse into the future that we're facing. And I want to remind people that we will bring back Professor Ben Jafar with your questions. I see a couple have been submitted, but please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and uh, submit questions and we'll come back to them at the end of our evening. So once again, thank you. Our next distinguished professor is Elad Tudmore. Elad Tudmore is professor of aerospace engineering and mechanics at the University of Minnesota. He received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology in 1987 and 91, and his PhD from Brown University in the US in 1996. He pioneered computer simulation methods and theories that span multiple length and time scales to predict the behavior of materials and nano devices, including 2D materials from their atomic structure. He's published over 70 papers in the area and two graduate level textbooks. Professor Todmore is the director of the NSF Open Knowledge Base of Interatomic Models, OpenKIM, which is a web-based cyber infrastructure tasked with developing standards and improving the reliability of atomistic simulations. He also serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Elasticity. Please join me in welcoming Professor Elad Todmore and take it away. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, you can tell from the title of my talk that this uh, uh, topic is not directly related to the research that uh, Joe just mentioned. Um, it's driven by a, a sense of concern that many of us share, I think, about the quality of discourse in our democracy. And what I'll tell you about in this talk is what we're trying to do about that at the University of Minnesota uh, by combining engineering together with social science, law, and media in a project called Science Court. So to start off, we should examine the basic premise of this, which is that the US democracy is in trouble. Um, and we ask ourselves, do the, is there evidence to bear this out? So we can look at this in different ways. We can start by looking at polling data. And so what you're seeing here is a response to a poll from 2016, where people were asked whether they felt that it was necessary to live in a country that was governed democratically. And what's, what's plotted is the percent of people that said that it, was, uh, that it was essential as a function or versus the year that they were born. So people born in the 1930s, over 70% felt that it was essential to live in a democracy. But this goes down with the age of the responder so that people who responded in the 1980s, who are th about 30, in their 30s right now, only 30% feel that it's essential to live in a democracy. Another thing we can look at is trust in institutions. And so, uh, and in particular, the government. And so this poll has been carried out since the uh, late 1950s, 1960s, 
And people were asked how much they trust government in Washington. And so in the 1960s, about 70% of people said that they trusted government uh, always or most of the time. This actually went up to almost 80%, but then it began to decrease precipitously with the assassination of John F. K., John F. Uh, Kennedy. And so the, this decline has been essentially going down monotonically over time with occasional, occasional blips of optimism uh, during the Reagan years and then again during the Clinton years. But basically it's saturated at a rock bottom level of distrust. Another approach to looking at this question of the health of the US democracy is to try to objectively measure the, the quality of a democracy. And so this was uh, taken on by the Economist Unit, which is the research arm of the Economist Magazine, sorry, the Intelligence Unit, which is the research arm of the Economist Magazine. And they put together a measure which gives each country a score from zero to 10 rating their government, where zero is a sort of the worst dictatorship and 10 is a perfect democracy. When this measure was introduced in 2006, the US scored 8.2, which puts it within the range of what this measure considers a full democracy, eight and above. But this meant, but we've been going downhill ever since then, and somewhere between 2014 and 2016, we crossed the barrier into what is now considered a flawed democracy by this measure. The reasons that are laid out in this report for, for this uh, drop are exactly related to the loss of trust in institutions that I mentioned in the figure above. And then finally, we can look at polarization in our political system. So this graph shows the uh, polarization in the House and the Senate. Um, and basically, the higher the score, the more polarized the, the institution is. And it's a measure of uh, the amount of collaboration between legislators coming from different parties and the amount of time they vote across party lines. And so what we see is that in the uh, 2016, late 2020s here, or late 2019s here, the House and the Senate were more polarized than they've ever been since this measure was applied, even more so than here at the beginning in the uh, early or the mid 1800s, right after the Civil War. You can see similar loss of trust uh, in many other measures of, of US life, from uh, society to business, religion, Wherever you look, except for the military, there's been a loss of trust in institutions. Now, a, a parallel to this loss of trust, there is also a distrust of basic facts. And in a recent study by Rand Corporation, they identified four related trends that together they refer to as truth decay in our society. So the first one is an increasing disagreement about basic facts, from anything from vaccines to GMO crops to climate change to COVID. Uh, people can't agree on facts. There is a blurring of the line between opinion and fact. So for example, interpretive journalism is a new form of journalism that mixes facts and opinion in a way that's not clear what's what. Uh, this is closely related to the rising influence of opinion and personal experience through social media, blogs, and so on. And then finally, there's a declining trust in the sources of factual information that people used to believe in. Distrust in institutions, there's deliberate interference by foreign entities, and there's technological tricks where you can basically make anything you want to look like anything else. So the question is, what can we do about this? Um, and one thing we can't do is just wait for this to pass. As you saw in earlier, these are 50 plus year trends, and it's gonna take as long for them to reverse naturally. Another thing we can't do is we can't fix this quickly. Unfortunately or sadly, polarization and distrust are deeply entrenched in our culture now, and they're amplified by multiple factors that uh, coexist with them. What we need then to do is we need to figure out how we can operate in this new normal. How can we get people to make good decisions based on facts in what is essentially a hostile environment? And so we approach this in this project from an engineering perspective. We have a problem. We have loss of trust and increasing polarization, which amplify basic limitations in the way humans reason. And that leads to an inability for a democratic society to work together to make decisions. And so our approach is to try and engineer a system for group decision making that has the following characteristics. We want it to be based on current understanding of how humans reason and make decisions. 
We want to allow people with diverse views to make rational fact-based decisions in this environment. We want to have to be able to impact society beyond the people that are participating in the process. And we want to have a mechanism by which this approach spreads throughout society. So our solution to this is science court. And science court is an adaptation of the US jury system. But instead of trying to determine the guilt or innocence of a, of a defendant, we're trying to adapt this system for effective decision making. This is implemented as a course in the university honors program, and it was developed with strong support from the College of Science and Engineering. The way it works is that students pick an issue, a controversial issue, they then spend a semester researching the facts, they conduct a jury trial where they present the information that they've learned as a case in front of a jury of volunteers, and all of this is reported to the public at large to engage as many people as possible. The course was developed and is co-taught by an interdisciplinary team, which includes engineering, social psychology, law, uh, media, and communication. So let me walk through, to make this less abstract, let me kind of walk through how this works in practice. So at the start of the semester, we have to pick a case that we're going to study. And we have well-defined criteria for what makes a good science court case. It has to be complex, it has to be controversial, and so on. The students are then divided into pairs, one liberal arts and one science major. And these pair of students work together to come up with an idea for the class to study. We give them a pool of possible suggestions, but they're free to go ahead and come up with their own ideas. Each pair then pitches the case to the rest of the class. We identify the most popular pitches of that group, and then we investigate them in more depth for some time. And then from those, we pick the final case that we end up spending the semester on. For example, in 2018, we picked a case uh, called one-to-one -one tech that I'll explain in a second. And so the way that a, a case works, a science course case is set up, is we identify some problem or, or issue in society, and we propose a thesis, some way of solving it. So for example, for one-to-one -one tech, the problem can be phrased as that effective use of technology and specifically electronic de uh, devices is becoming increasingly an increasingly essential skill that all students should be learning in school in preparation for participating in the modern world and, and workforce. And so the thesis is, or a possible thesis, is that Minnesota should implement a one-to-one -one tech program in K-12 schools. Now what one-to-one -one tech means is that students coming in at kindergarten would receive a, a tablet or a laptop that they would follow them throughout their educational career from K to from K kindergarten to high school and would be an integral part of their learning experience. And so we then go to research this issue and we start by dividing the students into three teams, a science team, a legal team, and a media team, each of which has different responsibilities. So the first step is to uh, research the facts, and that's what the science team is responsible for. And so we start by identifying the domains that impact the case. Every complex case is going to be affected by multiple domains of, of information. In one-to-one -one tech, for example, education, health and psychology, economics, policy, equity justice, and so on. Then under each of these domains, we formulate questions. Questions that we would like to know the answer to that the, where the answers affect the decision that we're going to make. And so for example, under education, we might have how do one-to-one -one programs affect standardized test scores? What can laptops do to promote le uh, learning? Uh, under health and psychology, does a one-to-one -one program increase sedentary behavior? Does increased screen time lead to mental health problems? And there are similar questions under economics and policy and so on. The students then investigate these questions. They go to the scientific literature, they look for journal articles, meta-analyses, reliable sources of data to answer these questions as best as they can. And this is an iterative process. So as they investigate questions, other questions come up, perhaps even complete domains that we hadn't considered initially that are important. In this process, each science team student becomes an expert in a particular domain or a subdomain that they have researched throughout the semester. We call them domain reporters because like good investigative reporters, they dive into this area and they learn as much as they can about it um, uh, and then ex explain it to the rest of the world. 
Now, in parallel to this, the uh, legal team students are preparing for a trial. But this is not a standard trial like you may be familiar from, because we've modified many aspects of it to make it more effective for our decision making process. And so, for example, we're not simply arguing yes and no on whatever our thesis is, because experience has shown us that it's very easy for one side to poke holes in the, in the case that the other side is making or to talk past each other. Instead, what we do is we divide the legal team into two, into two subgroups, a pro team and a, and a con team. And each team is responsible for coming up with a complete proposal that is more on the pro side, we call this the pro-ish proposal, or more of the con side of the thesis. So for example, in the one-to-one -one tech example, the pro-ish proposal might be that Minnesota should adopt a phased approach heading towards a full one-to-one -one tech program in all schools. Whereas the Kanish proposal is that support for technology, um, there should be support for technology teaching, but it should be based on evidence and school need. So a more targeted approach rather than this sort of general plan that one-to-one uh, -one su uh, suggests. Now, as they're working on their cases for this, at some point we have what we call a pretrial hearing, which is where the pro and the con teams have an opportunity to argue that certain facts should be inadmissible for the trial. This is held in front of a judge with a, an expert witness on scientific evaluation and decisions are made. And we come out of that process with a common set of facts. So you can't play a game where one side is arguing from one set of facts and the other side is arguing from a different set of facts. Rather, they have to make their argument for their case based on this set of facts that we all agree on. At the trial, evidence is presented by the domain reporters, those science team students who have become experts in particular areas. These, they are presenting a neutral view of the facts. And so unlike regular trials where you have expert witnesses that are hired guns for the prosecution or the defense, here the, the, the information is presented by neutral uh, agents that are just presenting the information. And then finally, we redesign the jury itself. And so we strive to have a heterogeneous jury, uh, a jury that has a mix of views and backgrounds and opinions because research shows that Diverse groups of people like that tend to come to better collaborative decisions. Um, the jury is empowered, so they can ask questions. They can take notes during the trial. Their deliberation is facilitated by an expert in communications to prevent deadlock. And the jury also, in addition to choosing between these pro-ish and con-ish proposals, has the option of offering a third way if they see a compromise that's been missed. And I should say that in the trial that we did in, uh, in 2019 on one-to-one -one tech, the jury actually voted 10 to three against one-to-one -one tech, but they proposed a third way, a compromise option. And then finally, the media team is responsible for getting the word out. And in many ways, this is a critical component of the entire science court idea, because we don't want just the jury and the students to get something out of this process. We want as many people out in the public as possible. And so the media team divides into a programming and a communications department. And the programming department is putting together media content. They write news stories that go on the website and on our blog. They, uh, they put together a bot podcast with episodes along the semester. Uh, there are video explainer pieces that either explain basic concepts in, that are relevant to the case or interesting research. This is shared both with the public and also used by the, uh, the legal teams to help educate the jury during the trial. There's a documentary at the end wrapping the whole thing up or giving the whole view of the entire semester. And all of this information is, is spread as widely as possible to the public through the communications department, through social media, and by interfacing with existing media organizations, both at the university and outside, to get people to cover this and listen to what we're doing. And I just want to wrap up by explaining why this is at the U. Um, when I started thinking about this originally, uh, several years ago, my, my thinking was that this should be something done outside of the university, perhaps as a non-governmental organization type of an effort. But I've since then become convinced that the university is the ideal place for a project like this. And there are several reasons. First of all, Science Court provides an, a natural conduit, a perfect conduit for transferring knowledge from within the university to society on issues that are of interest to society. Um, the students who take part in this course invest a great deal of effort to take com complicated concepts and break them down and present them in a way 
that this that uh, uh, lay people can understand, the jury and the public at large. A second thing is that this is run by students. The students are the ones that pick the case. The students are the ones that research it. They're the ones that argue it in front of the jury. Um, and so it's nonpartisan, it's non-threatening, it's a genuine attempt by people to understand complicated issues. And so we're hoping that that may be able to reach people that have become um, uh, suspicious of sources of authority or of expertise. And then finally, academia provides a perfect mechanism for spreading this ac across the country. Our plan here is to run this for several years until we have a good working model, package it up and make it available to other universities to pick up in their own programs. And so that other universities can run their own science courts um, and in that way spread it across the country. So as you can see, this is very much a public minded project. We hope that those of you that are listening to this will participate in this. Uh, our next case will be in spring 2021. So just in a couple of months, you can help us select our case. We'll be having an event soon to do that. Um, you can follow the preparations and the trial throughout the semester. And if you like, you can participate in the jury. So I invite you to go to our website or to sign up for our mailing list to be kept up to date on our events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Todmore. And thank you for showing us how important it is for our scientists and engineers to uh, engage themselves in educating the public and, and making us all more more literate consumers of scientific information. We'll move now to our final presenter of the evening, Professor Lucy Fortson. Lucy Fortson is Associate Head and Professor of Physics in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the U of M. She's a founding member of the Zooniverse Project and the current board chair for the Citizen Science Alliance. She's a leading expert in the field of crowdsourcing science. She's also a member of the Very Energetic Radiation Imaging Telescope Array System Collaboration, or VERITAS, where her group is studying very high energy gamma ray emissions and studying them very energetically, I understand, from active galactic nuclei used to understand the underlying emission mechanisms and black hole engine. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Fordson was vice president for research at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, where she held a joint research position at the University of Chicago. She graduated with a BA in physics and astronomy from Smith College in Massachusetts, received her PhD from UCLA in high energy physics while working at CERN. And lastly, I'm just delighted to say that this year she was elected a 2020 fellow of the American Physical Society. So please join me in welcoming Professor Lucy Fortson. Take it away. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Um, and thank you, everyone in the audience. It's really an honor to share this evening with you, uh, even under such uh, interesting circumstances. So uh, in this very brief talk, uh, those of you who know me know that I can go on about this for a very long time, but um, I will just give a very brief overview of the Zooniverse platform as a means to engage the public through crowdsourcing science efforts to help researchers tackle their big data problems. So this is a story about hay and how many hands make light work. And then how inevitably we invent machines to make the work more efficient so we can tackle even bigger fields changing the roles between human and machine as we do so. Um, I think uh, this was alluded to earlier in the first lecture. Of course, uh, it's not really about hay, but the huge amount of data that is growing uncontrollably in all fields and the problem of reaping the knowledge from those data. So we now live in a world where data is being captured everywhere about our universe and about ourselves, uh, all the, you know, personal medical information that we've got now uh, linked up to our phones. Uh, and of course, let's not forget paper, still generating a lot of data there. So this data deluge has given rise to an, an information explosion that has challenged our ability to analyze all these data in terms of the four Vs, 
volume, variety, velocity, and uh, as we were just hearing, um, veracity of uh, information, uh, which is of course very pertinent um, for these days. So the problem is there are just not enough experts in a given field to carry out the analysis. We have this uh, very large uh, analysis gap. Um, so it's hard to make the hay, as it were. So true to form, we are turning more and more to machine algorithms or artificial intelligence to close this gap. But it turns out that machine algorithms are only as good as their training. And much of that training data is generated by humans. And in particular, the more complex uh, data, the, you know, the sort of the veracity or variety uh, uh, complexity uh, data are very difficult for machines to classify. So we're back to needing um, at least a few graduate students uh, to provide the training data, and that's still not good enough to close the analysis gap. So confronted with that problem, we at the Zooniverse wondered whether the general public uh, could help in closing that analysis gap. So it comes down to the very simple question, which is better at spotting the tiger? The computer or a five-year-old girl? And while artificial intelligence experts would argue that their algorithms now can accurately identify tigers, the human brain has millions of years of evolution on any of those machines, and it is still better at inference and generalizing from small amounts of data. And that's a key point to our story. Okay, so the next question we had to ask if we wanted the public to help close the analysis gap is, are we still too busy trying to survive or do we have the cognitive surplus to help out? Right, so here's some numbers. We spend collectively 128 years every hour playing games like Candy Crush and Pokemon Go. So apparently we got so good at spotting tigers, we need to fill that evolutionary void with something. All right, so taking advantage of that cognitive surplus, uh, we built what we hoped would be the Candy Crush alternative, the Zooniverse platform. And this is a platform that allows researchers to put up projects asking for volunteers to help analyze the data. We crowdsource science. Since its launch in 2007, Zooniverse has evolved into the most successful citizen science platform worldwide, with over 2 million registered volunteers, including 30,000 from Minnesota alone, uh, contributing to well over half a billion classifications um, as of last night. These classifications have been made on over 300 projects, which have led importantly to over 200 peer-reviewed papers, which of course is the coin of the academic realm. Uh, and it's very important for our volunteers to know that their time is not uh, effectively wasted uh, by um, you know, research teams who don't end up actually using the uh, classifications that they provide. So anybody logging on to zooniverse.org can go to our homepage and you can select from the project page uh, any project um, ranging across a wide range of disciplines from astronomy to zoology. And so let's take a brief um, tour at a few of these projects just to see how the whole thing works out. So each project has an interface uh, with a task that's laid out. Uh, here this project is counting penguins to help researchers track the effects of global warming on penguin populations in particular uh, at the South Pole and the Antarctic. So there's a tutorial plus other information about the project to engage volunteers. And after you finish classifying, you can actually talk uh, about the classification or any other aspect of the project that is of interest to you. And in particular, you can ask the project team about the science behind the project or potentially any discoveries you might have made or you might think you have made. So the Zooniverse is built to be modular 
Here we see another version of the marking task, uh, where in this case, uh, we have volunteers marking dips in the light output from stars, or in this case, a star, um, in our own galaxy, looking for evidence of a planet around that star. Um, and so far, we've actually had 15 new planets discovered by our volunteers after analyzing the light from several thousands of stars in our galaxy. So definitely a discovery worth having your name on. Here we have another drawing task where our volunteers use a freehand tool to draw around the nucleus of a cell that is shown in an electron microscopy image as one slice of thousands taken from the same cell. And this allows us to reconstruct a 3D morphology uh, that characterizes the full cell nucleus. And when that uh, nucleus is under disease, uh, we can link or correlate uh, the shape or the morphology with that uh, type of disease. Here we have an example of a survey task, um, and this is featuring uh, one of our own uh, University of Minnesota projects. Uh, this is where we have camera traps that are set up in grids and used by ecologists around the world to take images of animals. The cameras are triggered by heat or motion, so millions of images can be taken in just one place like the Serengeti. Volunteers then end up sorting those images by species and then by the number of animals in an image and their uh, behavior. And all of this information then helps the ecologists understand the migration patterns and other um, ecological, uh, ecologically important uh, factors, especially when these animals under, are under the strain of climate change. And of course, we have all of human history to digitize, uh, especially handwritten text, which is uh, uh, difficult for machine algorithms to do. Um, and by digitizing, we help historians uh, with their research. All right, so how does this work? So the key reason why we can convert all these classifications into something meaningful for research is because we ask more than one person to look at each image. Sometimes we ask as many as 40 people to provide their best effort or their best guess or try for a single image. And then we merge those into a consensus answer. There's a well-studied effect, sometimes called the wisdom of the crowds, but known more mathematically as the central limit theorem. Uh, that means that multiple independent guesses, and of course, the more you have, uh, the better, will trend towards the mean, um, towards the correct value. It turns out Zooniverse volunteers have proven over and over again that collectively they are better than single experts at classifying the same image. All right, so many hands or brains actually do indeed make light work. So now we get to the rise of the machines. <laughs> so when we launched the Zooniverse, the haystack problem we were trying to solve was literally classifying all million galaxy images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey seen here in a portion of a fly-through of the actual distribution of galaxies measured. To understand how galaxies evolved over cosmic time, we needed to know what the shape was for each of these galaxies, whether it was more spiral in shape or more like a blob. We did that with the Galaxy Zoo project, the very first Zooniverse project launched in 2007, where over 100,000 people worldwide provided 40 million classifications through this interface in nine months which gave us labels or classifications for each of the million galaxies. Over 60 science papers uh, using these data have been published just by the Galaxy Zoo team alone. Very, uh, very rich data set. So that's fantastic. That worked incredibly well for the Sloan survey, which took 10 years to compile a million galaxies. What about the next generation of telescopes? For example, the Rubin Observatory coming online next year, we hope, uh, will generate over a million galaxy images per night, just not in 10 years, in every single night. 
compiling over its lifetime literally billions of galaxy images. And that is a big haystack indeed for us to um, work with. We need 25,000 galaxies classified per day to keep up. So there's no way that all the citizen scientists in the world could process that much data. So we need both humans and machines to tackle big data problems on this scale. Fortunately, artificial intelligence was becoming actually useful in the 2010s. So we thought, why not use the volunteer labels that we have to train a machine algorithm to get through the haystack that much faster? So our group here at the University of Minnesota began to tackle this problem. Here I'm showing a paper that was led by one of our graduate students, Melanie Beck, which showed that if you combine humans and machines where the machines continuously learn from the volunteers that are classifying on the system, the classification efficiency overall increases by a factor of 12, basically taking a month for the project to finish rather than a full year. And another thing we did to accelerate gathering labels is to put it on an app. You just swipe it as you see it. This turns out to be very effective at quickly validating what a machine thinks the object is. So you can start training the machines with fewer images. Then you only need to ask one or two volunteers to confirm if the image, uh, sorry, if the machine got it right or correct it if the machine got it wrong. This reduces the amount of volunteer effort by, in some cases, 50% based on another paper that we published, while at the same time providing more and better labels for another round of machine learning. So it seemed that lots of people liked to use galaxy images to train their machines' minds we did have a million images after all. So here we see a literature search just linking Galaxy Zoo and machine learning, and we can see this idea was really taking off. In fact, one of those papers showed that a winner of a machine learning competition didn't win by inventing some fancy new machine algorithm. He did it by generating more training images from the data set by just literally rotating and cropping each Galaxy image because of course galaxies there's no you know up or down in space it doesn't matter you can just rotate it clip it and there you have another image for your uh, training set so this underscores one of the crucial aspects of artificial intelligence that i brought up at the beginning it is voracious training machines requires a lot of images so, and it's not just astronomy building haystacks of data. Ecologists across the world are using camera traps that I described earlier, generating millions of images per project. Our first camera trap project in 2012 was Snapshot Serengeti using data from the University of Minnesota's Lion Center. We're now up to over 50 camera trap groups, including several more from the University of Minnesota alone, each with millions of images. That's great. We just deploy that artificial intelligence that we're so good at now. Because we have a lot of data, we can train the machines, right? But in fact, there's a hitch. There might be something else lurking in the haystack. And of course, that's the needle in the haystack. So it turns out there's two problems we need to solve, only one of which is the size of the haystack, cataloging all the hay in the haystack, as it were. The second problem is we need to know if there are any unusual things in the haystack we might actually really care about. The question is, can machines do this? Can the algorithms behind things like self-driving cars, for example, really be trained for all the possible needles and all the possible haystacks it will encounter? In Zooniverse, we refer to this as the Zorilla problem. For those of you in the audience who already know what a Zorilla looks like, you're a well-trained neural net. For the many of you who don't, it's not a cross between a zebra and a gorilla, more like a zebra and a skunk. The point is, out of 1.2 million images in the first round of Snapshot Serengeti, only 10 Zorilla images showed up. That is not nearly enough to train a machine to recognize Zorillas accurately. The question is then, will machines learn to detect even obvious needles in a haystack? Um, so machines don't always generalize very well out of sample, is what we say. They don't generalize beyond the training data that they've been given. 
but this is the thing that our big human brains are actually really good for. So within Galaxy Zoo, we found several needles, including discovering entirely new types of needles, like galaxies called green peas. And that's because humans have the ability to learn very quickly from inference. They only need a few galaxy image, images to know that these look weird. I mean, they look like little green peas. And the fact that even non-astronomer volunteers are able to explain what these look like to each other through the talk forum and pick out the features and train each other to go look for those features and comb through the haystack to find hundreds more of these examples. So the zerillas and the green peas are just a few of the kinds of needles that lurk in the haystacks that we're working on with the Zooniverse. It's hard enough for machines to identify even zerillas, but it's almost impossible for them to identify so-called unknown unknowns. How do you train for that? So we need a system which can optimize human attention where needed on the primary task, but eventually have humans focusing more and more on the harder classes of knowledge discovery, the really weird needles that are very hard for machines to detect. So Zooniverse has developed the infrastructure and, su and successfully deployed it on several projects that take advantage of the strengths of both human and machine intelligences. And uh, in closing, I just want to summarize, this is the sort of virtuous loop that we have now where we have all of the big data coming in. Some of it is siphoned off uh, so that uh, humans can label them to train uh, machine classifiers. But of course, then the machine classifiers can't find all the needles. So the humans are looking for the needles in the haystack. Um, and together, they, mo ma they make the most efficient um, uh, uh, combination uh, to tackle the big data problems that we have today. And finally, I just want to say, um, here are the University of Minnesota's universe projects that we have. Uh, and I'm really happy to say that we're about to launch in the next couple of weeks a new project that is a first in a partnership with the Mayo Foundation and the Hormel uh, Institute. And with that, I'll leave my uh, last slide up for thanking everybody that has helped fund us, including the CSE. And of course, thanks to our volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fortson. And, uh... Thank you for giving us a glimpse as to what we're talking about these days in the exciting world of, of humans meet big data, meet big AI, and, and their diverse applications. I'd like to invite back our other two speakers to the virtual stage that we have here uh, so that we can um, take some questions uh, that we've gotten in already I invite those of you who are out there listening, there's still opportunity if you want to uh, bring questions in, um, just type them in at the Q&A box. But I'm gonna start with a couple that we've gotten already and I'll take the, uh, the moderator privilege of occasionally combining some. So, so Saif, I'm gonna go to you first with the combination of two questions here that I think both reflect um, what are the limits of this new economy? One from, from Lowell Stolt, or Stolte uh, about, you know, is quality a casualty of this new economy? One from James Plasek about um, what about things like, you know, running out of raw materials when, or what happens when, you know, this transport from China slows down or components of medicine. Can these things really work in this, uh, platform supported small agent economy? Uh, great question. Thank you, Joe. Uh, let's see. So the, I'll, I'll take the question about quality first. Uh, so if you think about on demand, right, a feature that perhaps I didn't mention is the level of personalization that you also get with, with, with on demand. Uh, so scale economies are characterized by limited variety, right? When you're free from scale, 
uh, if variety um, can can be increased, and you can you can do what's called mass customization, right? So, if quality is related to how well the product fits the need of the individual, then certainly being free of economies of scale uh, will improve, right? Will improve, uh, will improve quality in that sense. So Henry Ford is famous for saying, uh, right, um, uh, that you can have any car as long as it's black. Um, now with 3D printing, for example, every imaginable shape and form is possible. Uh, when you experience, uh, I don't know, entertainment, uh, you go to a movie and everybody's watching the same thing. If you go to my house, everybody's watching something different. Um, uh, let's see. The, the, I think the improvement of quality is also because of all the data that we're collecting on everybody. And that is helping uh, in curating a much more personalized uh, experience, whether it's a product or a service. Uh, the question about uh, sourcing um, from China and other faraway places, as I mentioned, the trend is really, I mean, it's, it's, it's starting gradually to happen, but will accelerate, I believe, in the next five, 10 years, is moving away from global supply chains to much more localized supply chains, uh, in part aided by these new technologies. So when you think about 3D printing, it's kind of generic processes that use generic material to make lots of things. Um, the um, localization of agriculture also, urban farming, things, things of that nature. I think all of that will, will accelerate a move away from, um, from offshoring and outsourcing and to much more localized production. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Elad and um, I'm going to ask a question that came in from an anonymous attendee. Um, is the reduced trust in institutions and government that you talked about, is that perhaps due to access to better information? As people have the internet and Google, did they just learn that the trust that they used to have was perhaps misplaced? Yes, so lots of people have been studying why, what, what this trend is about, this reduced trust trend. And that's one of the, the reasons. I, I'm not sure I would say uh, internet, just internet, but the general, the motion uh, or the movement towards transparency that we've, we've set out as a value. As organizations become more transparent, you see a lot of things behind the scenes that maybe are not that nice. And so uh, that affects trust for sure. And, and that's distributed through the internet. So I agree with that. But that's only one out of five or six different reasons that have all been driving this. So there are objective reasons. Remember, I told you that the trust began to decline with the assassination of JFK. That was the starting point. And then if you follow the trend line, that graph that I showed you, you can identify blips along the way of, of further loss of trust. Corruption, uh, things like Watergate, wars that didn't end up so well. There are a variety of reasons that people lost trust that were objective reasons. Then there are other factors that are sort of it's unintended consequences. So for example, rising standard of living that people have been experiencing has led people to be more independent in their thinking. So they're less likely to simply accept, uh, to trust without, without evidence. Um, globalization, the fact that we share so many ideas from so many places has in, uh, exposes us to many different ways of thinking and many different ideas, which again goes against just trusting organizations. Um, Reduced socialization is another reason. People spend less time together. There are less members of a community. That also leads to, when you're part of a community, you're sort of used to trusting. And when you're not, there's less of that. And so, and then the internet itself, but in a more negative way than maybe you were suggesting, the, the question was suggesting, which is that it leads to echo chambers. It leads to people talking to other people who believe like them. It leads to conspiracy theories. And so, all of those things together have, over a very long period of time, broken down trust in our society, I would say. Thank you. Yeah. Lucy, a question perhaps inspired by the two talks coming together tonight. Um, 
all of these crowd people, the workers, um, what about being fair to them? Should they be compensated? Is, is this just, you know, this notion of a volunteer science group? Is it, is it fair to them? Is it getting the diversity of, of workers that you would want? Or is it leading to workers that, that come primarily from, from the leisure classes? What can you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent question, Joe. In fact, we just had a meeting with the team yesterday about this very topic. Um, as you point out, um, volunteerism can be associated with privilege. Uh, you know, people that have the time. Uh, also, we are aware that the uh, the our participants, our volunteers, tend to be more highly educated uh, uh, than the norm. Um, and so, you're right. Um, we have been very focused internally on what we can do uh, to try to encourage. Um, uh, people, for example, people of color to uh, uh, participate. There is a large environmental justice movement um, in citizen science right now that is focusing quite a lot on uh, issues of health, water quality, air quality. Um, and we are uh, trying to partner with the uh, groups there. Um, and the environmental justice movement, of course, is, you know, in some sense, sadly, uh, dominated uh, by uh, groups that live in inner cities and areas that are not uh, as well off. Um, and so, you know, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, volunteers uh, provide amazing uh, resources for us. Um, we haven't yet uh, decided that um, uh, to move to, if you will, a, a pay by bit uh, uh, model. Uh, we feel that the volunteers, there's, there's a motivation that comes about for uh, volunteers who are participating with us, and we've done studies with that. Um, they um, amazingly say that uh, contributing to research is the main reason why uh, they want to, to volunteer with us. Um, yeah, so we are, we do actually have a sister product uh, that is a uh, pay by bit um, uh, company that uses uh, similar technologies. Um, and so we're actually really interested to see how uh, the two systems compare. Great. Thank you. I'm going to come back to Saif with a question from uh, Ken Hafton. Uh, is working from home uh, a freedom from scale activity? And, and if so, what does that tell us? I, I suppose, I guess, and it works in, in both direction from the employer and the employees. So the fact that work can be done from anywhere, uh, right, means that um, an employee is now uh, no longer necessarily committed to a single, single employer. So you could work for multiple employees. The way, for example, uh, a lot of gig economy workers do, they have their, right, they're, they're switching between multiple uh, platforms. They're driving for Uber and doing stuff, delivering stuff on Postmates. And, uh, running errands on um, on um, uh, Task Rabbit, um, so it's it it used to be difficult, right, to do that to, to be to be to be um, to be able to to multitask in that way. Uh, and then from the employer's perspective, um, this is also freeing them up because now work is being digitized, so. Uh, and being done remotely. You don't have to bring people to the office for eight hours. You can potentially rely on um, freelancers. You can crowdsource much more efficiently. Um, 
so yeah, I think I think it's, it's, it's eventually it will lead to um, freeing up both sides from these commitments and will lead to um, um, an economy that's primarily contractor based or freelancer based. Um, yes, how soon it will happen? Yeah, it's a matter of debate. That's always the question. Yeah. So um, I want to first uh, extend my thanks to those who sent in questions. I know some of them we were unable to get to with the time we have remaining, but I really appreciate you know, your taking the time and energy to, to, to put in your thoughts. Uh, you've seen in the chat, there are links to find out more about these projects and, and the faculty and their groups that are behind them. Uh, I want to take just a moment again to thank our three distinguished faculty who are this evening's speakers and who uh, gave us a glimpse into some of the state of the art uh, research and teaching um, that's going on in the College of Science and Engineering. And finally, I'd like to turn things back to Dean Cave for a few final thoughts. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, you can see why we're so excited to showcase our faculty's work. It's amazing. Every time I'm at one of these lectures, I just, they just blow me away. So thank you. Thank you all. And uh, thank you um, for, again, for making the time to join us this evening it was our first experiment with this distant way of uh, delivering these lectures. And I think uh, thanks to uh, your participation and our colleagues here managing everything, I think it was, uh, it worked really well, at least it was for me. In the coming days, we will send you an email with several resources for connecting with a college, as well the link as well as to the link for the recording of this lecture. But I can't um, let us go without taking an opportunity to having an opportunity to thank each and every one of you for your generous past and continued investment in our students and faculty. Recruiting and retaining top faculty is a vitally important as they set the caliber of our students and our programs, our research certainly. Other universities always trying to entice away CSE stars. Support through endowed professorships and chairs are our best way to help keep them at the U, educating the next generation of scientists and engineers and exploring solutions to the, today's uh, grand challenges. We're grateful for your steadfast support and your constant belief in our students and faculty. I look forward to updating you on our progress as we navigate through this academic year and wish you and your loved ones the very best for the uh, coming months and year. Good night and be well. <laughs>